Um, uh, the title is The Three Difference. So, please. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank all the organizers very much for this opportunity. Can you hear me? Okay, for this opportunity uh, to give a talk here in a fantastic place. This was my first international talk was here in 94. And I did not mention the other day that, you know, uh, Chung actually organized the first real conference here in commutative algebra in 1992. So this has been uh, a, a wonderful place for commutative algebra. I think this is the fifth one. And we are really glad uh, that we can come here all together and you know, do the things we like. But in particular, I would like to uh, thank Jugal Verma because he did enormous work for all this, not just this conference, but for all this special year for tight closure. So thank you very, very much for all the effort, Jugal, that you put on to this and for everything you've done. And uh, I would like to just say one word about uh, the fantastic work that Mel Oxter and Craig Unick have done for commutative algebra. Um, I've, I have not worked um, so much on Mel, you know, mathematics. However, uh, you know, I was very much impacted by the way Mel shaped commutative algebra. Obviously, all of us have been very much impacted by his mathematics because he has done, as we have seen in uh, Craig's and as we have cited many of his work, um, he has done fantastic results and he has worked in seven decades. So obviously, we all be influenced. But as a woman mathematician, I've been very much influenced by the way he has shaped the field and has made the field very welcoming to everyone. Also, um, for Craig, is, for me, is even more personal because I've been influenced by his own mathematics for all my career. I think the way Craig has worked in commutative algebra, he has touched every part of commutative algebra. His work is so broad. And as Bern Ulrich said the other day, he has started, he may have not finished, but the fact that he started so many different, you know, uh, theme has given the opportunity to young people like me to get on this theme and to develop them. So I have worked on the core, I have worked on reduction, I have worked on algebra, I have worked on multiplicity where he started the everything. So I, my debt to, to Craig Unicke can never be, you know, said with a thank you as much as I would like to thank him for everything he has done besides being like, uh, you know, like uh, yesterday David Eisenbach said, just a fantastic, gentle soul. So thank you very much. You cannot hear me. Neither of the two is, you know, three o'clock or whatever in, in, in the Midwest now. But thank you to be and to have been such a pillar in our field. So now I would like to start with my talk. I don't know if I finish. I just want to, you know, be clear and, you know, not to be fast so you can follow because this is maybe a technical subject where not many people have worked on. And, but it's a classical subject, so there is a lot of work done in the past. So uh, I want to talk about difference, and I want to talk about, this is joint work with Bernrich. And uh, so this talk really talks about ideals that arise in the study of ramification loci. And they are the Kähler, the Nether, and the Dedekind different. So um, this, uh, my goal, is, our goal was to give a homological interpretation and give possibility to actually compute them in a different way. So, and um, to give actually for certain classes of rings explicit formulas. So let me introduce the players. So I assume that R is an algebra over A, essentially of finite type. Mm -hmm. 
I want to assume that A is regular throughout the talk, and R is reduced. And now, since I have this kind of, you know, situation I want to, I can write R as a polynomial ring over A. Let's add some variables. And then we localize. And then we go model an idea, let's say, is generated by F1, Fn. It's ideal I, OK? So once you have this, you write R this way, you can construct a matrix that we all know, and it's called the Jacobian matrix. So let's write the Jacobian matrix. And I'll write it, you know, now up, you know, in the polynomial ring. I can write it simply as um, the derivative of the f's. Let me write like this. OK? And it's clearly an n by d matrix. OK? So this is the Jacobian matrix. But now I want to take the image in R, OK? and transpose it. And if you take the transpose and the image in R of this matrix, you get, so I put the bar, and then the transpose, this matrix presents a famous module, the module of differential. So here you have R to the D, which is R dx1. This is a basis, R dxn, dxd, and the module presented here is the module of differential. Sorry, sorry. Yes, <laughs> now it's correct. OK. So this is the module of differential presented by this matrix. So it's very explicit. And we are all so much familiar with the module of differentials because it characterized the regularity of the ring. And we know that through the Jacobian criterion. Indeed, uh, I can look at the, uh, let's say that I have to assume something more for that. Can you read? Oh, it's too small. Is that fine? OK. Uh, that A is just a perfect field. And then this ideal I, I have to assume a little more, that is uh, equicodimensional, OK, of dimension of IG. So all the minimal prime, they have the same, uh, the same height. Then we can look at this uh, Jacobian ideal which is the fitting G, D minus G of the module of differential. So if you want it, the G by G minors of this matrix, OK? And what we know is that what the Jacobian criteria says is that the singular locus of R is simply given by this Jacobian idea. So if you want. Uh, the modular differential is free if and only if R is regular. OK, so we know that very well. And there is a lot, there are many, many uh, important questions about the modular differential, actually very famous conjectures about the modular of differential and about its dual, the modular of derivations. For example, the Berger conjecture. For example, the uh, Zariski-Lippmann conjecture, the Vasconcelos conjecture. And they, are op they were you know, obviously raised a long time ago, and they were open for a long time. And some of them, like the Berger, is still open. 
And we saw that Craig just recently has worked with Vivek, Vivek uh, cited, but it's still very open if you want to work on it. I mean, I know that Ulrich started his thesis on it. It's a very important conjecture. The Zariski Lipman is one where, you know, uh, Meloxter made a big, big impact. He solved the positive uh, graded case in characteristic zero. And remember, the um, Vasconcello was almost solved by Briggs very recently. So these are very important, uh, lots of acti activity on this area. So where are we going now? I'm going to define the, the players. So, and they are connected, as I said, to the module of differential. So uh, hopefully you remember my uh, setting. So don't forget the setting. I have to raise the board so I can write. Ulrich told me to write very large because I have the money to write small, but then I have to erase. So, um, so um, I will say, so now I want to assume even more. I want to have that A is a local ring, not only regular, but regular local, and the map is local. So let me put R and a different maximal ideal and a different residue field. Okay, and this is local, all right? And now we say that a ring R, the ring R, is R ramified if the following are true over A. So what has to be true? The first thing you have to have M has to be obtained as an extension of N. So M has to be equal N R. And the second thing is that extension of residue field. So this extension has to be separable algebraic. Yeah, yeah, same assumption I was before. A is regular. A is still regular and reduced. That's from the beginning. I said I'm never changing my assumption. Okay. Yeah, and now I take it local, the local situation. And um, um, what I want to define now, I want to state a theorem about this. And the theorem, I mean, maybe it's attribute. My attribute is not correct because there are, it's a classical result, but I would say Berger Kunz. And um, they characterize that R is a ramified over A if and only if the module of differential is zero. Because they do compute the minimal number of generator. And so you can see that a zero exactly. Um, when these two conditions are, are satisfied. And now we can define the first difference. There are three, as I said, and that's the Keller difference. And that's easy to define. easy to define, the Keller difference is simply the fitting zero of the module of differential. So I have to always have the extension here R over A and the case tails for Keller, okay? So if you want is um, the d by d minor of this matrix here. And we can see that it's very much related to the Jacobian ideal. And indeed, we can get the Jacobian ideal from the Keller difference. You know, you can take A and nether normalization. And if you vary the nether normalization and compute the scalar difference, you can obtain the Jacobian ideal. OK. And now, immediately as a corollary of the theorem, we get that the Keller difference defines the ramification loci. Because what's happening? But it's happening that the fitting zero, you remember, is connected to the annihilator of a module. 
you know, what annihilates a module of Eisen, but for example. So we know very well that what's happening here is that the Keller difference is contained in the annihilator of the module of differential, and they are equal up to radical. So now I will define the ramification log psi, and as corollary, we get that, better get the, the right pen. So I want to erase down there, otherwise the blackboard is messy. So I don't have a messy blackboard. Okay, let's see what's happening. So the ramification low side, the ramification can be defined as the Q in spec R such that when you localize A at the contraction, this extension is ramified. And then obviously this is exactly the support of the module of differential, and because of this is given by the Keller difference. Okay, now, Actually, we have even more. We have that the, uh, I mean, we know a lot about the ramification loci because there is, for example, this famous theorem. You have to assume a little more, though. Um, there is this famous theorem, which is called the purity of the branch locus, that was proved, for example, by Zariski, Auslander, there are lots of names attached to it, Nagata. And it says that, so you have to assume that um, the characteristic is zero, R is also a domain, and then you have two fields, two quotient fields, and you have to assume that extension of the quotient field is algebraic. And then um, uh, if R is normal, they either this uh, guy, uh, you know, the branch locus is zero, so, so there is nothing, or uh, is, uh, you know, is pure in dimension one. So you just have to check, to check a rem um, that if something is ramified, you only have to check a prime of dimension one. So now uh, I want to go to the second difference, the second player. So let me go to the second player. For the second player, I have to, again, look at the module of differential, but in a little bit different way that we did now. Okay, not just through the presentation matrix. Another, in a certain sense, definition of the modulo differential. So remember that there is another approach to the modulo differential. You can consider the enveloping algebra, okay? And then, obviously, there is a natural map, which is the multiplication map that sends it to R, and this map is always surjective. Take two elements, you multiply, this is surjective, it gives you everybody. But there is a kernel, and the kernel is the so-called diagonal ideal, okay, which is generated by x tensor 1 minus 1 tensor x, x in R. Uh, and so this is the diagonal ideal. Let me write diagonal ideal. And this allows us to give another definition, because one can prove that omega is simply, if you want, d over d square, which you can also write as d tensor over the enveloping algebra with r, okay? And now, how can I define the next difference? The next difference, which is the nether, was introduced by Emmy nether, okay? Different is, so you take the annihilator. This is an ideal in the enveloping algebra. You look at what annihilates this guy, and then you push it with this map, you know, mu to R. So it's the image of the annihilator of D, obviously, in the Melvin algebra, okay? So this is a little bit more obscure as a definition, but this is the definition of the nether different. And uh, because of this, and the fact that the fit in zero is contained in the annihilator, we get immediately the inclusion. I mean, you have to 
work a little bit, but not much. The inclusion of the Kähler in the nature different. And then you get that this is also uh, containing the annihilator of the omega, but the annihilator now over R. So you have this inclusion which tells you that the nature difference also defines the ramification loci. So I'm using again that fit in zero is containing annihilator to do this. Okay, and then what happens when you, you, know, you push it to F. I remember H1 and later, remember over R E and over R. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, the second different I want to go. I want to ask, one could ask obviously, and this is a very classical question. So, oh yeah, Alessandra. R tensor R over A. Yes, down here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now, what's happened? Now I, uh, I was saying that one is already interesting. This was a classical problem. How, when are these equal? Okay. In general, we'll ask this question about all three different. And this um, is true, for example, if um, R, you see, um, is a complete intersection and uh, is flat over A, okay? So this ideal I that defines um, R is a complete intersection ideal, and also R is flat over A. So let me write flat uh, local complete intersection, okay? And now that we are here, we can go for the third different, the third guy, which is a little bit harder to define. No, 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 no. This I just say when they are equal. No assumption. Just when they are equal. They are equal in that case. I don't assume that. No, 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 no. No. I want to go now to the third difference. But let me tell you that, as I mentioned before, this is a classical subject. So many, many people have worked on it. So I don't want to, you know. I mean, obviously, there are the old guys, like Nether. You see, I mean, Nether is involved here. But very Herzog. I mean, the old guys. I mean, Ether is, is gone, so yeah, she's old, definitely. And then uh, Tate, Berger, Kunz, but Herzog, Valdi, we have many, many names. Mukwai, Zurich, these are young, a little younger than Eminator. But Lipman, <laughs> Shea Storch, <laughs> <Jay> Star <laughs> you know. <laughs> we have a lot of names attached to it, so I'm sorry if I don't mention some of the people, but, um, uh, you know. Um, the, the, the last difference, though, is the most classical, because it's the one introduced by Dedekind. So it's the older and come from number theory. And so a little bit the definition is more even harder. But uh, I'm not going to give you the precise definition, so don't, I give you a way to define it. But what I, I need to work with it, which is usually the best way to think of it. So I want to define the third difference. I do need to assume a little more than I even assumed so far. So um, I assume, I actually define it when this map is finite, okay? But I can put essentially finite after you can localize, but I'm gonna do it when it's finite, okay? I'm defining it when it's finite, okay, Dale? So I tell you <laughs> already. And then I have to assume that, so this is obviously a field Okay, because A, remember, is a domain, is a regular domain. And now, uh, R is not a field, but uh, is reduced, so it's a product of field. And what I want is that the extension, this extension, you know, I want them all to be separable because I want to have a trace map, okay, a well-defined trace map. And then the... Uh, Dedek indifferent, the third player, is fractional ideal, in theory, is the inverse of the complementary, the Dedek complementary module. I'll tell you what this is. And so it's the inverse of this module. 
but it's not a fractional ideal because in my case, R is normal. So it turns out to be an, A is normal. So it turned out to be an ideal, okay? Because A is normal. R is not normal, but A is normal. So this is an ideal. So an ideal in R, it's an ideal, okay? And what is this complementary module? This guy, this doesn't write so well, is isomorphic because A, a is Gorestan to a canonical module of R, okay? So just think of this as the inverse of the canonical module, okay? And you can even fix A plus is another normalization. If you fix the another normalization, it's actually unique. You can think of the unique canonical module of R with respect to A, so in that setting. Okay, so just think about it this way. And then you can ask again, how is related to the other different, okay, because obviously this was already there when Nether introduced her different. The Dedekind was what was there. And then obviously she introduced this new different. She has to compare it with what is there. And, and that's actually harder theorem. She does prove that the uh, R different, the Nether different is always contained in the Dedekind different, so this is always contained in the Dedekind different. So you see already an inclusion. The, the Kähler is in the nether, is in the Dedekind. And uh, when do you have equality? But equality here actually, the way uh, she phrased it, because at that time, we couldn't say Arco Macaulay, there wasn't Arco Macaulay. She phrased it saying R is free over A, but that's the same as saying that R is Macaulay. Okay? So this is the situation where they are equal. So as I said, now I want to just uh, compare them and talk about the quality. This, they all uh, actually, the dedicating is harder to show, but does define again the ramification low side. So they all three give you the ramification on loci, but with a very different scheme structure. And what's happened is that the Dedekind and the Nether are a little bit nicer as ideal. They're always a mixed. The Kähler is not, usually, but the Kähler is more explicit. Though it doesn't mean that the Kähler is actually easier to find because it's a mess to find this determinant, these Jacobians. It's actually somehow the Dedekind because it's an inverse of a canonical module, and the canonical module is very much studied, is somehow a little bit easier in that sense. So it's important to know the quality even to compute them explicitly, to compute the, the Kähler, for example. And the fact, actually, that they are equal or their comparison implies the classical result that was used by Oxter and Juneke, that uh, the Jacobian ideal is uh, you know, contain, uh, contained in the conductor. And also the fact that was proved initially by Tate that the Jacobian ideal coincides with the Sokol for an Artinian complete intersection. And now it's been generalized by Ulrich and Eisenbach, for example. So, um, you know, um, I will uh, talk about the different, and what I want to do is, um, as I said, as giving a normological interpretation. Now, you could ask in general, when they're equal, what was known before us? I think the most general thing known was that, obviously, it's a complete intersection. Everybody is equal. But more generally, if R is an almost complete intersection in the linkage class of a complete intersection, then we knew that they were all equal, OK? So that's a more general thing. But we'll see other instances now for classes of ideals. There is another player I want to introduce, but this player is much well known and actually was talked a lot and is somebody that, you know, uh, Craig has worked a lot with, is simply linkage. So let me uh, talk, introduce for the third time, at least in this conference, uh, what a link is and what liaison is. All right, so I have uh, uh, R is a local Gorester ring. And I and J, you don't need that, but it's okay, ideals of R. We take a complete intersection 
alpha 1, alpha G, and then we have that I is alpha color J, and J is alpha color I. We know, we have heard a lot about, you know, um, linkage already, so I don't have to say much. I should say that the reason it was introduced in the so classical was really to study varieties, and also to classify to classify variety, but also to study them, to understand them. And for example, there are very interesting results about class group of rigid algebras. They were very much studied, for example, even from me, um, uh, myself, and uh, Urich, and Juneke, and Vasconcello, to, to uh, study rigid algebras. So there are like residual intersection. Uh, residual intersection are even more like parsley, we say in Italy, ubiquitous. But linkage is extremely useful tool. Uh, linkage, Gorostel linkage, they're all very useful. And, um, however, to study what we want to do now is not consider a single link or even the linkage class. What we want to do as a, f as a fourth player, I'd say, because I already, uh, maybe fifth player, because I already mentioned the Jacobian ideal, the fifth player we want to compute is the sum of all links. So, the way I'm going to define it actually is like this. If I is a complete intersection, I just want it to be complete intersection. I want it to be R. And if I is not, in comp if I, is not I want to take the sum of all links. Sorry? <laughs> so if I is a complete intersection, it should be R. If I is not a complete intersection, it should be the sum of all links. So why do I do that? Because this sigma i, and actually sigma i modulo i, encodes all the property of the linkage class, all the property of the links. Uh, I mean, it, it encodes a lot of information, and, um, and more or less the linkage behavior of i. This was already studied very much, for example, uh, we used it uh, to understand blow-up algebra again, because we used it um, uh, uh, to prove that direct links of symbolic power of prime ideals are integral over um, a complete intersection of the reduction number one. So it creates a lot of, you know, ideals whose result algebra is Macaulay, and that has good behavior. So it's, it's quite important. And we want to, uh, we'll see as better behavior than a single link. So we want to really look at this all together. And what's the idea? The idea is to look at this Jacobian, this free difference, and this sigma i over i, and give an homological interpretation. Okay, so that's the main theorem. So let me state the main theorem. I have no idea what I'm doing with time, but it's fine. Whatever I do, I do. I would like to get to some application, but so I will not spend any time giving you proof. Maybe at the end I'll give you a proof of, an idea of the proof of the application, but just tell you a little bit. So what's the main theorem? So there are really only two assumptions, so it's clear what the assumptions are, <laughs> you know. So the assumptions are only really two. I'll put them here big, so it's clear. So I assume something about K. I assume that K is an infinite perfect field. It doesn't erase well the board. I wish I had my chalks, the Japanese chalks. K, an infinite perfect field. And then R, instead, is a local, complete K algebra. And then I assume that is reduced and comecoli. Okay, so these are my assumptions. The rest is just notations. So if you are in this setting, the notation are the following. What can I do? I can choose. So all the rest is stuff I choose. I can find a nether normalization inside R. Okay? And this is going to be K. Let me see how many variables I want to put here. Y1, Yd, because that's the dimension of R. Okay? Inside R. And R can be written 
as a quotient of a power series ring. And so I take A and I add as many variable as the height of the ideal that I go modulo, okay? And remember, this ideal is gonna become a coli. And it's gonna be generically complete intersection. The thing is reduced. Actually, complete intersection could dimension one, yes. A is this one, it's complete, yeah. And not only, this is separable also, okay? So I can even take it um, separable, uh, so this is a step, A is separable. So why do I do this, no other normalization? Because I want the direct, you know, the direct to be defined. And we need a trace map. So you have to, to, to assume this, this, this kind of thing. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Yeah, is it K algebra? Yeah. Okay, so very, very good situation. So, but remember, this is just, you can choose it. This is just because of the assumption. And then what do we take? This is another strange thing. I, and I'll tell you why I, after, why I do this, but why I want to do it in such generality. I can find, obviously, uh, even a regular sequence, but now I don't want to assume it's a regular sequence. I just want to assume that this guy generates I generically. So they don't have to be a regular sequence, and this is going to be very important from the computational point of view, because that's very hard to find, a regular sequence. Instead, you, it's easy to find guys that generate I generically. And then I want to take a Jacobian, a precise Jacobian, the Jacobian, just these are G element, these are G variable. You get a G by G matrix, take that determinant. And you take the image in I, in R, in R. Okay? So this is my what I call delta is an element. And then I consider, I told you it's an homological interpretation, so I have to consider a minimal S resolution. This is S, I should call, say that this is S. S resolution of R. So really we are going uh, minimal free S resolution of R. So we use a, a free resolution. And then I take, I, I complete this F1, Fg to a system of generator of I. I call them again F1, Fn. And I take a Kozul complex. Okay, this is the Kozul complex of F1, Fn. Call it K, okay? And I is generated by F1, Fn. So, so far all stuff you can find. And then what do you do? You wanna consider a, a map between these two. And this map should be, this morphism complex should leave the identity in S. So let me write it because it is the main gadget we are going to use. And it's actually very easy. This is already Macaulay, so you can do tons of examples because it's all in Macaulay already done. So U is a morphism of complexes. Such that U0 is the identity in the ring S, the regular ring S, okay? And then I need a base element because I wanna specify some things. So I consider, so all this stuff I choose, a one veg veg EG, okay? And this is a base element, the first base element of KG, the G spot in the Kozul complex, okay, with what are a, the AI? AI are exactly the basis element of K1, they go to FI, okay? So these are the bases of K1. So I fix this guy. And why do I fix this guy? Because when I look at the, uh, uh, this comparison, I want to look at the last comparison map, the G comparison map. And this will give me one column. 
the first column. And I call K the ideal, the column ideal, the ideal generated by the entries of the first column. generated by entries of first column. And then we can consider, we can find, I mean, it's actually easy to show because of my assumption, a non-zero divisor as an entry in K. Then you can change the basis of FG to move it in the first spot and call it gamma. Gamma is a non-zero divisor on R. We move it, and then we can consider the row ideal that contains gamma and call it H. So this is the ideal generated by the first row. So imagine that the situation is this. I, I'm going to try to, uh, I don't write, so uh, otherwise I really don't tell you anything else because I have nine minutes. First row, first column, first yes, of the, that's what I'm going to try to say of uh, what our first column and first row of what? That, so of, I'll call it phi, that's why I was going to make the picture, which is UG tensor R, okay? So I take the last comparison map, so here you have KG, here you have FG, this is the end of the resolution because it's come coli. You have a beautiful map here, comparison map, and uh, call it phi because phi is not UG, but is UG after you go modulo I. So tensor R. This is the guy I look. And I want to take the entries, the idea generated by the entries of the first column, and I call this H. And then I want to, no, did I call it H? I, yeah. Yes, I called it H. That's good. And uh, yeah, that's OK. I called it H. I thought I was calling the other L, not K. K is not a good name because we have a K. Sorry, guys, I'll change the idea. I call it L. So, sorry. So this is H, and this guy instead is L. And this entry, so this is the first, shouldn't go out. This is gamma. Okay, gamma is just here. And L? Column ideal, H row ideal of this map, all right? So now that everything is set up there, and you also know what this guy is, and this guy is, I can state the theorem. And then I would like at least to tell you the application. I mean, when it, we compute something, otherwise, so let me just tell you the, the, the statement of the theorem and then, without spending so much time, and so I can at least tell you the important application, otherwise. I do have more time, though, because I started four minutes later, so I, I've been checking the clock. Otherwise, then what do we get? Then we get, we describe all these objects in terms of this, Delta, gamma, H, and L. And H and L are there, okay? So first of all, the complementary module, though this is not really us, because Kunz and Valdi have it already. Once you know it, you remember, is the a canonical module, and they already express it as a colon ideal, and you can see that this is a colon ideal, okay? So at least when F1, FG are a regular sequence, this is Kunz and Valdi. What actually we prove with Bern is that you don't have to consider a regular sequence. You can consider any set G element that generates I generically. And as I said, it's important for computational reason. Uh, it gives, as you know, our, my, our students is here and she knows that computationally is much easier because <laughs> she's doing all this, computing all these guys. So it's just one over delta times L. Okay, that's what the complementary module is. And now, when the Dedekind, you get it right away. Remember, it's equal to the nether because you are a Comecoli ring. And this is a link of this, I mean, not a link, the inverse of this. And I can do it with gamma because gamma is in L. So it's gamma over delta and gamma 
colon L, okay? Because they inverse. So this is okay. It's not uh, so much surprising. But then we express our job is really to find the Kähler difference. And the Kähler difference is the same multiplier, gamma over delta. Did I do it the other way around? Yes, because it was the inverse. So it's delta over gamma. So delta over gamma, and now is time h. So this is isomorphic to the inverse of a colon, and this is isomorphic to a row. And then I'm not going to write it, otherwise I have no time. Uh, you can write the Jacobian, obviously, once you have this. Okay, again, with H and a precise Jacobian. And you can write, uh, I'll, I'll skip the Jacobian, I'll write instead sigma I over I. That is I1 of phi. So all the entries, the ideal generated by all the entries of this matrix. And I will, uh, as I said, want to go to the application, but let me tell you two things only. Why is this important? Because it looks like oh my God, this is more mysterious than what you have in the definition. Like the Ned, the Kähler, it's, a, it's a, some, some kind of the, you know, minor, ideal of minor. Why is not this more explicit? And this H is more explicit because actually this is much easier to compute. So it is more explicit. And it's not just this. It's also the fact that this H and L, the form is specialized. So this is very going to be very important for computation. And that's the same for this ideal, that usually the links don't deform, they don't specialize, unless you have some information, you know, regularity on the link, some regular sequence on the link. But this guy is that the form is specialized. So that's actually the good part. Also, we recover immediately the inclusion of this scalar and this ideals because H times L gives you gamma. This matrix has rank one, so H times L gives you gamma, and also when it's going to be an equality, it's going to be an equality if and only if H is gamma colon L. And you see that a mixedness is very important because then it's a mixed. Okay, so now I want to go to the application. And I have, I think, five minutes at least. So let me go to the application. So we actually compute it. I'll tell you what the application are, and maybe I skip the first two, which are easier. So the application are, we compute it for grade free Gorestan ideal, and it's just in term of Fafian. In that case, they cannot be equal because this ideal is principal since, uh, you know, obviously, the canonical module is principal. So this is the inverse of a principal ideal, so it's principal. And this one is not, unless it's a complete intersection. But this is a Fafian. But this you can get from the, um, you know, uh, from books bound Eisen, but practically. And then we compute the great shoe perfect. And then what we really do, which is the big thing, is do it for maximal minors. So for maximal minor, both of a generic at the beginning, but we can actually get it for um, any matrix where uh, we have some assumption on the height. So let me write that theorem. Then I can tell you a little bit, at least. At least the theorem, even if I cannot say how. So I skip the first two cases, which are easier and I go to the uh, main application. So you have M times N, a generic matrix. Well, then we get it, for example, for, for uh, scrolls and stuff like that, generic matrix. And I assume that M is strictly less than N, OK? Characteristic zero now. That's important. And when you look at the maximal minor, and you look at X prime, which is a ma the matrix where you delete the first row. So M minus 1 times N matrix. Uh, obtained from X. Okay? And then in this case, we get that they're all the same. 
They are all equal. All three different. And what are they? They are the power, delta over gamma like before, very explicit. And when you take the maximal minor of x prime, and you have to take it to the n minus m power. Okay? This obviously works also for i2, though for i2 doesn't even have to be generic, and uh, in the grade 2, perfect case. And um, you can also write the sum of links, and this is simply the uh, minor, the n minus 1 minor of the big matrix to the n minus m. And now what's happened if it's not generic? I will just, since I don't have much time, just tell you. If I take the word generic out, then what I have to assume is that obviously this has the uh, best height possible, so n minus m plus 1. And then I have to assume that the ideal of m minus 1 minor, so this ideal, has to have height n minus m plus 3, so two more than the, the one of this, because I want that the ideal is generically, is um, a complete intersection in codimension 1. Then if I have, and it's actually necessary, we have an example, but if you don't have that, it doesn't work. With these two conditions, you don't get equality in general, but what you get is that this guy is the n minus m symbolic power, and this guy is the power. And again, because this specialize, but in that case, the, <laughs> the symbolic power doesn't have to be the power. In the generic case, it is by, uh, you know, Bruns and Vetter. But in the, in, in the, if it's not generic, it doesn't. And in fact, there is a quality if and only if the symbolic power is the power. For example, in the scroll, they are never equal. And you actually have the expression exactly what it is. OK? So, and the proof is really using the fact that this L and this H deform. So you can go to the generic case, and there you can prove it and use M Ashrinivasa multiplication structure, okay? Because F is an algebra and is associative. But that's very difficult to actually compute that these are equal. It's not easy at all to show that this, even using the multiplication structure, you cannot show, I mean, you show an inclusion, but you cannot show that every product of such minor is appears. So you have to actually use the action of GLNK over the matrix. Because then using the action, if you have one such product, you have the all power. You get the all power. And then you use the fact that they are mixed. And then they use the fact that in codimension one, you know, is a complete intersection. So they're all equal to actually prove that they're equal in general. OK. Thank you very much for having listened to me. Thank you. So is there any question or comment? Yes. Oh. I would be surprised if Alessandra doesn't ask the question. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, you know that you there are not that right, many people good. that can I'm ask questions happy. about residual intersections. So your abstract said that you were using techniques from residual intersections. We but you use residual intersection in the proofs. And actually, you can get a beautiful inclusion. You can get that there is a, a sum of per certain links is containing the color different. The color different is containing the nator, which is equal to the Dedekind. And this is containing a residual intersection. Because really, the assumption that is here can be free, they're equivalent assumption. One, you can say that R is reduced and this thing, but you can also say that the ideal, this ideal is a residual intersection. F1, Fg, gamma, colon I. This is a G plus 1 residual intersection of I. That's really the assumption. And that's what makes everything work. So really, you need, these are the kind of assumption that we are using there. And yes, we use linkage, we use residual intersection. That's what we use in the proofs. And, um, you know, and actually, there is a nice, for the minor, yeah, I, I think I wrote it correctly. Did I wrote it incorrectly? Ah, no, this one 
you think it's the colon or the link? Yes, you're right. But anyway, colon K, <laughs> the famous ideal K, but that's why I didn't want K to appear there, which is at one FG colon I. Yes, that's correct, you're right. That's why I didn't want K to appear. And um, so this is a resonance intersection, and this is a geometric link. So that's what really is under there. And they, um, in fact, uh, for minors, there was some result of Jenna for residual intersection that you can use for the link of minors and do the same characterization from the other side, because these two are equal. She proved that residual intersection is a sum of links, can be obtained as a sum of links. So even in that case, the Kähler and the Nether, which is another case, they are equal, and you can express it as a residual intersection. Yeah, so at the end, the Kähler becomes a residual intersection. So as you see, there is all this buried there. Yeah, okay. I just didn't have Thank time to, to keep that, the proofs or anything. What about Fafians? Do you have a similar No, results? we don't. And we only have for grade three, and that's actually, we ask our student, now she's working uh, there, she's there, she's working for no maximal minors, She's trying the no-maximal minor. We did not try the Fafian. We expect the Fafian to behave well, but we have not computed the Fafian. And we talked with uh, uh, Aldo. He says that when you have symmetric matrix, it can be harder, and everything can be very different. Okay, next so we are very far. <laughs> so we told her, don't touch symmetric matrix. But uh, first try, it's already very difficult for no-maximal minor. She's trying the two by two minor of any matrix. And the behavior she says, she finds already very beautiful behavior appearing there. So it's clear that there is a lot of fame, mathematics there already, yes, yes. And it's nice to get this classical object back into light and to investigate them back and see what they can tell us, yes. Thank you. Do you I have a, a question, yes. if I can ask. Uh, what about uh, if you're over a perfect field K, what happens in the theorem? You I mean, you the first, the main theorem is fine. It still works. It doesn't need characteristic zero. But here we need characteristic zero. Otherwise, even the Emma, first of all, in our proof that uh, using the action, everything falls apart. Resolution. Process. Yes. Yeah, okay. But the thing about the resolution is still valid. That it just needs K perfect field. So the main theorem that says that is one is isomorphic to the, the you know, to H, and the other is isomorphic with this delta over gamma to, uh, you know, a inverse of L, they are, they are still valid for any perfect field. But then when you go to the application, the case of the maximal minor, you know, that case, you know, we do use Emma and she has characteristic zero because you remember she divides when she computes the thing. Mm -hmm. And we do use the action. We couldn't do it without the action. And, and the action, needs it, I mean, our theorem, at least even we have to go to the real number and then back to the complex number to do the work. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah. We, but we, you don't have counterexamples to these. Figures. We don't have I mean, counterexamples, no, we don't. We don't, in, we didn't compute it in characteristic P, no. We don't have characteristic, so, so one could look in characteristic P. Remember, we always, we are always in equi characteristic case, mm -hmm. in any case, because we always have a K algebra, so inside, I mean, even to do, to define well then, the data can different and all of that, you know. But yes, I, I don't know in characteristic P. That's completely open. What you about and you have to find different methods, that's clear. It could be still true, but you have to find other methods. In, in these classical invariants, there's a discriminant ideal, which I, is, relate, is at least related to these things you're talking yes, about. Yes, but we did not look at that, yeah. but yes. Yeah, so there are lots of interesting objects there to look at. Thank you. So there may be some more questions, but it's maybe it's time. So let's thank the speaker again.